with more than 750 historic homes, buildings, and sites, Silvertown Historic District is one of Georgia's and the South's largest and most complete examples of a planned industrial community of the early 20th century. Yet, Silvertown is much more than a collection of buildings, it is a community. While many of the original mill workers are now gone and the mill itself no longer stands, Silvertown remains vibrant and valuable. The story of Silvertown begins well before the construction of the mill, its houses, stores, roads, and community facilities. Georgia's textile industry began to flourish during the period of Reconstruction following the Civil War, and the industry's success caught the attention of established manufacturing enterprises in the North, many of whom took on interests in textile facilities in the South. By 1900, textile manufacturing had become a major industry in Georgia and by 1920, there were at least 116 mills in the state. At the time, Georgia's textile industry employed more than 27,000 people, many of whom resided in company-owned housing. For smaller towns like Thomaston, the industry transformed the local economy, population, and landscape. In 1899, a group of local entrepreneurs established Thomaston Cotton Mills, which became a leading textile producer in the area. One year after the company's founding, Robert Edgar Hightower became president. An Upson County native, Hightower spent his youth in Thomaston, attended the R.E. Lee Institute, and married Mattie Lou Harrison. With Hightower and his fellow executives consistently reinvesting company profits into the local community and textile industry, Thomaston Cotton Mills saw great success. As the enterprise expanded, it diversified its product line and built new facilities, adding finished bedding products, apparel fabrics, and tire cord to their product line. In the mid-1920s, at the height of his professional career, Hightower negotiated the tire cord deal that led to the development of Martha Mills and eventually Silvertown. In 1925, a group of executives from leading tire manufacturers B.F. Goodrich and Fisk Rubber Company came to Georgia in search of a textile mill operation capable of supplying a massive amount of finished cotton tire cord. The group's local guide was Chip Robert of Atlanta-based Robert & Company, an innovator in textile engineering and architecture. After visiting mills in cities throughout Georgia and Alabama, BFG and Fisk chose to work with Thomaston Cotton Mills. And so, in what Mr. Hightower characterized as the largest single contract in textiles in the history of the world, Thomaston Cotton Mills entered the budding automobile tire industry in full force. Having secured a contract to produce $100 million worth of finished tire cord, Mr. Hightower and the rest of the Thomaston Cotton Mills Board of Directors were faced with the daunting task of actually producing the cord. Existing facilities were quickly put to use making cord, but the executives knew that a new mill would be necessary to satisfy the prescribed demands. To build the new mill, Mr. Hightower entered into a three-party agreement between himself, supplying the land and serving as the initial operator, BFG as primary buyer and capital investor, and Robert and Company as architects and engineers. In 1926, workers began construction of the new tire cord mill in a village to house its workforce and their families. Mr. Hightower named the factory Martha Mill after his wife, and the new plant was outfitted with state-of-the-art machinery, elevating it to the top tier of the industry. On New Year's Day, 1927, Martha Mills began operation in a limited capacity, and later that year assumed full production. Within its first two years of operation, the mill grew to support at least 500 employees. Within the first year of operation, a village of 125 single and multi-family homes was constructed just south of Martha Mills. The area, which later became known as South Village, includes a collection of simple yet impressive bungalows set in a gridded layout of roads and walks. South Village's pleasing aesthetic demonstrates the value placed upon developing a respectable, attractive community to support the industrial enterprises at Martha Mills. Martha Mills was instantly successful, 
and, before the end of the second year of operation, B.F. Goodrich decided to exercise an option to purchase the mill and assume full control. In so doing, the rubber company became engaged in the business of not only producing tire cord, but also in community development. In June of 1929, on the cusp of the Great Depression, BFG began expanding the mill and village. They named the community Silvertown after its most popular line of automobile tires at the time. Within six months, BFG added two huge additions to the three-story mill, making Martha Mills the largest plant dedicated exclusively to manufacturing tire cord in the world. The mill's striking Art Deco exterior, as designed by Robert and Company, emphasized BFG's embrace of modernity. Anticipating the need for a workforce of approximately 2,000 employees, BFG also began immediate expansions of the village to include more than 500 new bungalow houses. Because the village was considered a vital part of the mill's operation, the company sought to provide what it considered a total living environment for its employees, complete with churches, schools, stores, medical facilities, community spaces, and housing. While there was a hierarchy of housing in Silvertown, whereby executives were provided larger and more centrally located houses, all residents of Silvertown paid rent to BFG. The company maintained all roads and communal spaces and provided electrical services and even ice. Silvertown, being a new city, was thoughtfully and beautifully planned by prominent landscape architect and city planner Earl Sumner Draper. To promote healthful living and industry, Draper's plan incorporated ample green space, walkability, and a full range of social and recreational facilities. Earl Draper, who became nationally renowned for the design of industrial towns and suburban neighborhoods, drew on principles of the English Garden City and suburban residential models in the design of Silvertown. Efficiency and comfort in terms of access to green space, public amenities, and work at the mill were critical. Historically, the business and community center, which included schools, churches, and shops and entertainment, occupied a large open green space at the heart of the district. A system of curvilinear roads and sidewalks conforming to the natural topography provided access to distinct yet cohesive residential areas surrounding the two triangular-shaped formal entry features at the center of the community. BFG executives, many of whom sat on Silvertown's city council, made every effort to provide physical recreational facilities according to Draper's suggestion and design. However, the organization of activities was largely left to the people themselves. The Silvertown ballpark had overflow crowds on a regular basis. During the 1930s and 40s, citizens attended first-class textile league baseball games, held great high school state championships, and hosted summer youth baseball matchups in Silvertown. The community also maintained a tennis court, parks and playgrounds, and a scout hut. Despite the real economic hardships caused by the Great Depression, Silvertown flourished as a community with a textile manufacturing backbone. During the 1930s, BFG added an additional 50 homes in the West Village area, growing the district to its present-day size. Mill operations continued to increase through World War II as BFG diversified production to support the war efforts. But, by mid-century, Technological advances had begun to exact major changes within America's textile industry. By the late 1950s, BFG had already sold many of the village houses to mill workers and was engaging in the process of relieving itself of the burden of town ownership. In a series of political events occurring in 1958, BFG dissolved the Silvertown Charter, donated all streets, sidewalks, and utilities to the city of Thomaston, transitioned the schools to the management of the Thomaston Board of Education, and transferred ownership of the churches to their respective congregations. BFG's enterprise remained active in Thomaston until 1997.
Over the past decade, most of the buildings associated with Martha Mills and B.F. Goodridge have been demolished, with the original boiler house and stack remaining. Despite the near total loss of the mill complex and alterations to some of the district's historic homes, Silvertown remains, as it was designed to be, a place where people can enjoy their lives while working hard and rearing their children. While parts of Silvertown have no doubt been lost, the community's legacy is preserved in both the physical and social character of the district. Indeed, the community remains very much intact thanks to recent efforts of its citizens, culminating in the development of the Greatest Generation Memorial Park, which occupies the historic green space at the district center, as well as the achievement and honor of listing in the National Register of Historic Places.